Good morning, church. I'm so glad that you joined us today. If you haven't liked the church's Facebook page, go ahead and do it now while we're watching so you can stay informed on what's coming up in the next few weeks. Stay connected with us online for some devotionals coming up throughout the week, new worship music, and some different ways we can still be serving our community. Even though we're in our homes this morning, we're no less of a unified church than we were when we met all together. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us today. The church has left the building. Good morning, church. Our call to worship this morning comes from Hebrews 13 and Psalm 66. Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of the lips that acknowledge his name. Shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing to the glory of his name. Give to him all glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Thanks be to God for his word. Oh, 
morning, everyone, and welcome to the Church in Peaster and our and our Sunday morning online services today. Very uh, special message that I want you to really take part in with me. I want you to get your Bibles, and let's begin. We're going to begin in the great book of Romans. We're going to just one verse today, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. We're going to be covering that. I have entitled today's message, The Gutter or God? The Gutter or God? Now, let me tell you how I came up with this crazy title. Let me even give you the date to verify. You can look this up. I'm sure that it's on record. But it, this, th what I'm about to tell you is so strange that I want proof that I heard what I heard. I heard this, Jody and I both heard this, on Sunday, May the 3rd, on a news report, a local news channel, okay? And it was out of Dallas. And we were sitting there watching the late news, and uh, the reporter was talking about a denomination that's having drive-up confessions. And since they're going through social distancing, they had their priest out in the front parking lot, and they were having drive-through confessions. And uh, that in itself is pretty strange to a, to a guy like me, but anyway, that's all right. That's what you want to do. But as the reporter was signing off, he or she, I don't remember if it was a man or a woman, but he or she said, so all you really have to do today is drop your sins off at the gutter, at the curb, I'm sorry. He said, or she said, all you have to do is drop your sins off at the curb. And, and, and Jody looked at me. She knew that was going to set me off because I'm an atonement guy. You know that about me. The blood of Jesus. It's only he is our high priest. We don't have to have, a, we don't have, to have an earthly priest. We have a priest under the order of Melchizedek, a royal priesthood as our confessional priest. We go through Jesus to have our sins forgiven. But I was just thinking about that and how that applies to today. And I want to read for you Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greeks. Great is grace, uh, is great. Grace is great. So here's what I want you to know today. I want you to know what is the true gospel. Do we just drop our sins off and our cares and our concerns off in the gutter, a curb? Do we just write it down on a piece of paper and, and hope that it'll be forgiven and, 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 and put into a plate somewhere? No, no, no. Listen, sin is a serious matter. Sin is a serious matter. And we can't, I think the world just wants to think they can just write it down on a piece of paper. <clears throat> when I was in Japan, in 1973, on a mission trip, I found myself with a couple of others in our church as we were walking up, and there were these huge lions, huge statues of lions in the jungles of Hokkaido. And um, the, what they had around their neck were hundreds and maybe even thousands of these aprons. Somebody <clears throat> had tied aprons around their necks. And so these lions in the jungle that were spaced out, you know, apart from each other, uh, they were all within walking distance, but you would see them in the jungles with these hundreds of ragged, torn aprons tied around their necks. Well, and they all had writing in Japanese. Now, I can't read Japanese, but they all had writing in Japanese on these aprons. And they were, they were just loaded up around the necks of these lions. I asked our tour guide, his name was Leem, and I asked Leem, I said, Leem, I don't understand these lions with all of these, these aprons tied around their necks. And he said, John, he said, it's very, now he was Japanese, so he had a heavy accent, as I'm sure I had a heavy accent being from Texas to him, but in a heavy Japanese English accent, he said, he said, John, that's how sins are forgiven in, in this local religion. I said, what are you talking about? He said, if you sin, you simply write down your sin on one of these aprons that you buy from the temple. You write it down and you climb up on that lion and you tie the apron around the lion's neck. When that apron is weather-worn, 
and, and turns to dust because of the weather, your sin is then forgiven by that God, by that lion God. I just, I just couldn't believe it. Think of the guilt. You have, to, you have to go by occasionally once a month or once a year to check and go through that whole, that whole bunch of aprons to see if your particular sin has been forgiven because it's deteriorated and the material has rotted away to nothing. It's the same thing that I heard on that newscast. All you have to do is write down your sin on a card and drop it by the curb. And then you can go on with your life. You can go on with it. Well, what about the kingdom of God? Let's talk about that kingdom for a minute because we're dealing with some very special things here. You see, you can either drop your, you can either drop your sins off at the curb or in the gutter, or you can drop your sins off where it needs to be, and that's at the cross. It's either the gutter or the cross. It's one of the two. It's either the gutter or God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's one of the two. Where do you stand on this issue? It's an it's a eternal issue. It's, it's, it's going to affect your eternity, heaven or hell. People say, well, hell doesn't exist. Well, but you better hope it doesn't because I'm telling you, as sure as heaven exists, then hell exists. As sure as God exists, Satan exists. I know we don't want to talk about it. I know that I know it's supposed to be old school and you're not supposed to talk about the wrath of God and the judgment of God. But let's think, look, the reason that we're going to be judged so severely is because of the sacrifice that was made by Jesus when he came to this earth. Think about the sacrifice. Let, let's go there. I mean, what has God done to see that our sins are forgiven and that we can live with him in eternity, that we can become a part of his church and a part of his eternal kingdom? What has he done? First of all, the thought of it is stunning. God became a man condescending, stoop, stooping down to man's level. Is that not love? Is that not grace? Is that not humbleness? God humbling himself, becoming the, in the form of a man named Jesus. I, I hope that that just grips our hearts this morning. So just the incarnation of God becoming man, is enough, it ought to make us sit down on the floor and just contemplate, and that's why we worship. That's why we praise his name, so we have the incarnation. If you get past the incarnation, then there is this life, this 33 and a half years of life of God on this earth. He walked it to perfection. You see, the first Adam in the Garden of Eden failed. God's created son, Adam, created daughter-in-law, Eve. They failed with a perfect environment, with a perfect home, with a perfect love of their father, a perfect conditions. They chose to sin, to disobey the word of God. So once that happened, God didn't use a created being anymore. He used his begotten son, Jesus, an eternal being himself, fully God, to come to this earth and to be born, and then to do what the first Adam could not do, to live a life of perfection without sin. Think about that. He was tempted in every way that you and I are. He was, he was, he was beaten. He was lied about. He was abused. He was accused. He was even accused of having the power of Satan himself. But he never sinned. He never sinned sin. He did. He performed what the first Adam failed to do, and that is to live in communion with his heavenly Father from the day he was born to the day he ascended into heaven. He did it to perfection. So not only do we have this, this gospel, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is a gospel of God being born into this earth. It is a gospel of God walking out perfectly, uh, uh, as a man, fully man and fully God, as walking out as a man this thing called life to perfection with never having uh, a, a sin in his life, sinless perfection, the only one who's ever accomplished that. Well, next, how much, what about this gospel? Do we just drop our, do we just drop our cards off at the gutter? Do we just tie our sins around the lion's neck and hope that it deteriorates in the 
in the rainforest. Now, we have the incarnation. We have the perfection, the incarnation of God. We have the perfection of God. And now, most importantly, I think, we have the crucifixion of God. Can you imagine? Can you, do, do, we, do we ever just sit back and just think? Do we ever just sit down in our living room floor or on our bedroom floor or on the side of our beds and say, let me just think about the crucifixion. God, the master of all things, creator of all things, all atoms, all molecules, all, all cosmic, seismic thing, everything, creator of all things, saying, I will allow this, this, this little insignificant being called man, I will put myself in his hands, allow man, man, mankind, a, 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 a created being out of dust to abuse me, to put a crown of thorns on my head, to, to stab a spear into my side, to nail my hands onto a cross and my feet onto a cross to pluck out my beard, to spit on me, to beat me until I am nearly unrecognizable. And I will allow men to, to so abuse me that, that you won't even recognize me when this day is over, the day of the crucifixion. Unbelievable that God would allow himself to be turned over to the judgment of a little insignificant ant called mankind. That's love. That's what God has done. He started out with the incarnation, the enfleshing. God became a man. Then this man named Jesus walked a perfect walk with uh, doing the will of his father as the second Adam. Then God allowed himself to be brutalized, brutalized and murdered by his accusers and by the Romans. My goodness, what grace, what grace. Incarnation, perfection, crucifixion, and then the resurrection. God is now vindicated. Everything that Jesus said came true. He descended into hell he released the captives there. He proclaimed the gospel of Jesus to them in hell. He won the victory. He took the gates of hell, unlocked the gates. And now because of that, we don't have anything to do with hell. We are all products of the kingdom of heaven. Drop your sins off at the gutter. Mm -mm. Drop them off to God. Understand the incarnation and the love and, and the and the determination of God to do incredible things. Think about a perfect life and how hard that must have been. To know that you could have called 12 legions of angels and they would have rescued you. To, have, to, to be a perfect man and still have every accusation in the world thrown at you. To even be called by his enemies the son of the devil. Unbelievable how we have treated God himself, who has stooped down from heaven, has stooped down and shown us through his life, all we have to do is believe what happened, believe the story, and we shall be saved. That's how much God loves mankind. That's, we are the apple of his eye. And any, any failure to see that deserves punishment. God can do no more. He will not do any more. And the next time you see Jesus, you will not see him as the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. You will see him as the Lion of Judah coming back to judge the nations and judge people and individuals who have refused his great grace and love and sacrifice. Oh, how we underestimate the love of God toward mankind. We have the incarnation. We have perfection. We have the crucifixion. We have the resurrection. One of my favorite parts is what we now have is now called the session. When after it was all said and done, the call the session in theological terms, where Jesus as the high priest now goes with his own blood 
as a high priest behind the veil into the throne room and presents the blood of the Lamb, his own blood, to the Father and now sits down at the right hand of the Father interceding for the saints. Praise the Lord. If that doesn't get you thrilled, something's wrong. Something in your spirit's wrong. Something in your mind is wrong. Maybe you've spent a life just dropping off your sins in the gutter or tying your sins around a, a, a lion's neck, hoping they'll just deteriorate with time. No, sin does not deteriorate, my friend. It's always there, and God will not let you off the hook. Why? Because he didn't let himself off the hook. He took the blame. He took the sin. That was not his. It was ours. He took it and nailed it to a cross. God did that, not some martyr, not some not some mis, misdirected lunatic. The Son of God, the Savior of the world, loves us that much that he went through the crucifixion, now the resurrection, now he's gone through the session, and he's still the Lamb of God. He's still the Lamb. And then we get to where he goes from being a lamb to a lion. Now we get into the return, the rapture, the calling away of the church. When the world, see, we think it's real bad now. Folks, I have to tell you, I'm just being honest with you. I've seen worse than this in my own lifetime. And I understand, I'm not making, I'm not making light of it. I, I want, especially our senior adults in our church, God bless you. If you're 65 or over, we love you, think about you all the time. And we want you to come back, but we want you to be safe. We want our children to be safe. We want our nursery to be safe. We want our people that come to church to be safe. The idea of exposing you, especially you senior adults, the idea of a pastor purposely exposing that part of his congregation, I think is, would be a sin against God himself. It won't be much longer when we'll be gathering together, but not now. Stay patient. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Read the scriptures and know that we're with you and that we are still a church and that we've seen worse than this and we will come through this stronger than ever. I guarantee you. The Lord told me that. We're going to have some pruning. No doubt about that. But that's what makes a stronger tree is the pruning process. So we have the, we have the birth. We have the incarnation. We have the perfect a perfect life of Jesus. We have the crucifixion of God himself, the resurrection of God himself, the session with God with himself, the return. And, and here, comes, here comes the hard part. God gets a bad rap because everybody thinks he's just a God of judgment or a God of wrath or a God of, of, of anger and meanness. But, but what, what have I just said about God? There is nothing more, there's nothing left for him to do to save mankind. You'll never see him come back again as the lamb. It's not going to happen. He will not, he will not come back as the lamb ever again. He is right now. This is called the opportunity of grace that we can just by believing, receive into our hearts a loving God. Look at what he did. Read the scriptures. But it won't be that way forever. Because soon, and very soon, I believe, he will come back. And he's not going to come back at this kind-hearted, sympathetic figure who hugged lepers and who healed lepers and who raised the dead and who had kind conversation with his disciples. You see, because of the extremity, the extremity that he went to to save us, there is no room for non-judgment. The judgment will be true. The judgment will be right. You're not going to be able to stand there in front of God and give him excuses. I, 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 love, I love what the Bible says. One of my favorite scriptures is Romans chapter 3. Let's just look at chapter 3 verse 4 and see what it says. It, it's pretty stunning. Let God be found true and every man be found a liar. Let God be found true, and let every man be found a liar. In other words, what Paul is saying here in the third chapter of Romans, chapter 3, verse 4, is that 
no matter no matter what I think about myself, no matter what I how I think I can save myself, no matter what I think about my my life and my priorities and my family and my relationship to God, no matter my deepest thoughts, once they're put up against a holy God, I become a liar. I'm not as good as I think I am. I may not even be as bad as I think I am. But as I judge myself and as I try to, to, to justify my actions before God, I am found, according to Romans chapter 3, verse 4, I am found to be a liar. We all are. But God, his words and his judgments are true. Let every man be found a liar. Let God, he, he's, he's, he, why is he true? Why? Because of what he's done. Because of the birth, the incarnation. Because of the life, perfection. Because of the crucifixion. Because of the resurrection. Because of the ascension. Because of the session. Because of the empowering of the Holy Spirit of the church in Acts chapter 2. What more could God do? Well, there's only one thing left to do. And that is the judgment. When it's all said and done, we will all be judged, and God's words, his judgment, will not be prejudiced. They will not be according to your color, or your size, or your weight, or your gender. His judgments are true. Our judgments, our defense, will be found to be a terrible lie, even to our own. We'll know. We'll know that his words are true. In ending this morning, I want to share something with you that happened to me just this week. You know, Jody has me doing all kinds of chores. I can't wait to get back to what we normally do. She's making it very difficult on me. And to be fair, she does more than I do, but that's don't tell her I said that. But one of the things that we had in our front yard, and it's been there for many years. It was there long before we ever put a house on this land. It was an old cedar tree. You've seen them, just an old Texas cedar and so about 10 years ago, maybe not that, quite that long ago, I trimmed it up to try to help it. It was, it was not a pretty tree at all. But I trimmed it up to try to give it some you know, style and make it look nice and, and nothing. It, over all these years, it's just, and, and you know, most cedar trees in Texas are evergreens and it's, they stay green all year long and no problem. But not this one. It, it's always been pale. It's, the needles always fall off and the grandkids step on them. It's just, it's just an ugly tree. So one of the things that we've wanted to do, and we started talking about it several months ago, was to remove the tree. Well, I knew that was going to be a hassle because I know how cedar trees are anchored down in roots. I mean, they have hundreds of roots. Some of their roots grow like fans. And so you just, you just got to dig down and get dirty, and just it just takes days to do. I can't get a tractor in my front yard. I don't have the room for it. And so I knew it was just going to be a, a, a chore. So earlier this week, I started digging, 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 digging. And then my son brought by a chainsaw, and he saw it and saw it. And I dug down about a foot, and there were still roots everywhere. And we finally got it out. And while we were so happy, and so he left, I just said, look, you, you know, I know you've spent half a day here. and Maybe all day just you can go home. I'll, I'll handle everything else. As I got to looking at the stump that we had, huge stump, pretty heavy, I noticed that it, the way that it was built could be made into a table legs, a, a stand for a beautiful cedar table. Except I, it's covered in cedar bark. Now, I got to tell you, cedar bark is just flat ugly. I've got cedar trees, so I'm not picking on on you, I'm just saying, I've got as many cedar trees as anybody, but they're, they're, they're spiny, they're sappy, they give you, you can't touch a cedar tree without coming off with two or three splinters, now you know that, or stickers in your fingers, so they're just, the bark is just, just ugly, but I, I thought to myself, boy, if I could just take that bark off of there, I'd really have something beautiful. But I didn't know how to take the bark off of it except stripping it off my hand. And that would have taken weeks to do it that way. Well, a friend, I was talking to a friend of mine. And he says, I'll tell you how the pros do it. 
I said, how's that? He said, they power wash off. Well, I've got a power washer. It's small. And my son even said, I don't think that's going to work. He said, I don't think that thing's got enough power to, to knock off the bark off of that cedar bush. Well, sure enough, I got I drug the thing out, Jody and I, and she helped me, and we drug it out of there, and, and I put it out in the front, and, and it's just this stump, ugly stump with bark all over, and mud, and mud, dirt, years, a lifetime of just mud and dirt and grime and bark. It was nasty. Fired up the power washer, and I started hitting that thing. And folks, what I saw before my eyes was one of the greatest transformations I have ever seen. I watched it happen. As I started power washing off that bark, it was just coming off. And underneath that bark was the most beautiful, white, kind of a, kind of a yellowish, you know how cedar looks when it has its bark taken off, as smooth as it could be. It had little red strips that sometimes even wound their way around the, the veins of that white. It was beautiful. I'm telling you, I, 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 would, I studied it. I'd go out there and, you know, over the next day or two and just look at the, the, the intricacies of it and the beauty of it. And, and now it's going to become a stand for a beautiful cedar table, which will undoubtedly become a family heirloom someday. I think it's the same thing that we need. What we need is not to just drop our sins off in the gutter or confess them to a man. What we need is a power washing, knocking off that thing, that bark called life, that bark of bitterness, that bark of loneliness, that bark of, of regret, that bark of anger. God wants to power wash us through the through the power of the Holy Spirit, and knock off that bark and make something beautiful out of our lives that people can look at and say, man, that was ugly before, but look at it now. It's, 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 it's special. That's what God wants to do. He wants to knock off that bark this morning. He's knocked a lot of bark off of me over the past few weeks, and I know that he probably has you too. But whatever bark is left, let Jesus and let the Holy Spirit power wash you to expose what's really there. Love, joy, mercy, gratitude, and everything else will take care of itself. Do you drop your sins off at the gutter today? Don't. Take them to God through the blood of Jesus. And in your mind and in your heart, say, Lord Jesus, by faith, I believe in you. I believe that you sent your son. I believe that he rose from the dead. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe he is now interceding for the saints at the right hand of the Father. And I believe he's coming back. By faith, I receive that into my heart. And if you do, your name will be written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. God bless you this morning. Thank you so much for watching. And may the grace, the life, the death, and the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus be in your mind and be in your hearts today. God bless you. Thank you. Hey, church, we just wanted to say thanks again for joining us this morning. We know that you want to be faithful in your giving in this time. I want to remind you that we do have three ways to give. The easiest one being download the Church Center app, and it walks you right through it. Another way is to get on our church website, thechurchinpeaster.com. And if you want to do it old school and mail it in to the church's P.O. Box at P.O. Box 90, Peaster, Texas, 76485. You can do that too. We love you all, and we hope to see you back and be together soon. But until then, the church has left the building.